Pray with me. Father in heaven, you gave your son on this day above all other days. We remember the price of our salvation. We pray you, send us your Holy Spirit that we may know how much you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like his sorrow. Why has God become man? Why does God have flesh? Why does God have a heart that beats, lungs that breathe, a brain that learns and ponders for this? To die. His heart beats to live and move, only so that it can stop beating. His lungs draw in breath only so that they can cease breathing. His brain controls every human function in his body only so that it can stop abruptly at the final moment. His eyes see the greatness of creation only so that they can grow dim. His ears hear the words of his disciples and accusers only so that they are closed to the cries and shouts of the onlookers. His hands work and pray only so that they can be pinned to a wooden cross. His blood courses through his veins only so that it can flow from his side down the cross to a stain in the dirt at a place called Skull. God is a man so that he can die for you. When the man Jesus, our Lord, finished his course on the cross, he was the perfect only sacrifice. Like lambs offered in the temple, he was innocent. Like Passover lambs, not a bone in his body was broken. Through the shedding of his blood, he made forgiveness available to all who looked on him for eternal life. Let us therefore confess our sins to God, our Heavenly Father. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you not as we wish, nor as you desire, but bringing our faults and failures, our willful sins, and our thoughtless errors. We have put our own physical comfort ahead of loving you. For threats to our health or a lack of daily needs, for facing uncertainty in our living, we have turned to fear rather than trusting in you. On our own, we cannot free ourselves from our weaknesses. Forgive us. Renew in us clean hearts. 
and set our feet on paths of loving obedience to you, to your will for the sake of the man Jesus, who is your son and our brother. Amen. Just before he breathed his last, our Lord declared, finished the sacrifice for sin that he had always intended. There on the cross we behold the man, our God who died for us. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you for all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask the governor for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two of you do you want me to release for you? Barabbas! Give us Barabbas! What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asked. Crucify him! Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Crucify him! When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified.
Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews! They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those standing there heard this. He is calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said... Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, and the rocks split. The tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified. Surely he was the Son of God.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Throughout Lent we have been saying, Behold the man. And tonight we behold the man on the cross. This is his purpose. This is why God is man. So behold the man on the cross, bleeding, gasping, suffering, and dying. Behold the man who has hands, which the night before were washing his disciples' feet, and now they are pinned with nails to the rough crossbeam of this instrument of torture and execution. These are the hands that formed the first man, Adam, out of the dirt. And now these hands are stained with blood and dirt. Behold the fingers with which he touched lepers, placed into the ears of the deaf man, picked up bread to declare it to be his body. Now these fingers spasm uncontrollably every time he has to pull himself up on the nails through his wrists to take a breath. But this is why God has hands. Behold the man who has skin that has been shredded with the Roman flagrum, with lacerating bone shards and bruising steel balls woven into the leather straps to inflict the most damage to the skin and the greatest suffering to the one being beaten. Behold the skin of his back that now scrapes up and down the rough timber of the cross as he struggles to breathe. But this is why God has skin. Behold the knees of Jesus stained and bruised from falling under the weight of the cross that he was forced for a time to carry up to the place of the skull. But this is why God has legs. Behold the man who has feet, nailed to a cross, bearing his weight as he dies. Behold the feet that walked from town to town as he taught his disciples, healed the sick, preached the good news of man's release from the captivity to sin and death. Behold the feet that Mary anointed with a pound of expensive ointment, washed with her tears and wiped with her hair. Behold the feet that are now bound in place. Behold the feet that must endure stabbing pain as they push on the nail, pinning them in place. Behold his heel, which in the act of dying is crushing the head of the serpent, destroying the kingdom of Satan, answering for mankind's sinful rebellion. This is why God has feet. Behold the man, behold his head, with blood flowing from each place, one of the thorns on this mocked crown is pressed down through his skin. Behold the head that should be rightly crowned with majesty and glory surpassing every earthly king's crown. Behold the head over which has been hung the sign listing the charge that brought his death sentence, the king of the Jews. Behold the head that, like his forefather David's, would have been anointed to make him a king. This is why God has a head. Behold his face, which has fresh swelling and Bruising from the blows dealt first by the high priest's officer and then by the officers jeering at him to prophesy, Who is it you that struck you, Jesus? Behold his eyes, which at the beginning looked out on all that he had made, seeing that it was very good. Behold the eyes that looked with mercy and compassion out on the crowds, on his disciples, on the sick. Behold his lips, which spoke words of forgiveness, but now are dry and cracked from a deeper thirst than you will ever know. Behold the cheeks that were kissed by his mother. 
Behold how his face now contorts with agony. But this is why God has a face. Behold his lungs as they slowly fill with fluid. Behold the lungs that breathed life into Adam's nostrils. Behold the lungs that in this hanging posture can't exhale without the man pulling his whole body up on the nails to open his airway. Behold the lungs that expel one final breath as he cries, it is finished, and gives up his spirit and dies. And this is why God has lungs. Behold his bones, which remain unbroken throughout this torturous ordeal. Behold the reason for every sacrifice, every Passover lamb, every bull for the whole burnt offering, every scapegoat, every ram, every turtle dove had to be healthy, had to be intact with no broken bones, no disfigurement, perfect specimen of its kind. Behold the soldiers who, with their clubs, shatter the legs of each of the thieves that are hung on Jesus' side, but they stop from doing the, the same to Jesus. Because this is why God has bones. Behold the man. Behold his side. Confirming that he is truly and completely dead. His heart has stopped. Behold the deep sleep of death that has come upon this man. And on the sixth day of the week, like Adam, whose side was opened to create his bride, Eve, behold the material from the side of this crucified man, which God will use to fashion his bride, the church. Behold the side of the man which disbelieving Thomas will place his fingers into. This is why God has a side. Behold his blood which pours from his lifeless body, staining the wooden beams of the cross, spilling out onto the dirt, reddening the soil, watering his creation. Behold the blood that he first shed when he was an eight-day-old boy, undergoing the sign by which all Jewish boys were made into Israelites. Behold the blood for which the crowd thirsted and ironically asked for exactly what they needed. His blood be on us and on our children. Behold the blood that was foreshadowed on every day of atonement when the blood of the sacrifice was splattered on the mercy seat, on the altar, and on the people. Behold the blood he gave to his disciples in the cup the night before, telling them its function, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Behold the blood that proves that this God was also truly and fully man, a brother in blood to us sinners. This is the blood by which this eternal high priest enters once for all into the holy place, giving sinful men access to a holy God. This is why God has blood. This is no accident, nor is this a tragedy. Jesus himself said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to take it up again. This is why God is man. Not to teach you how to be good. Not to show you the right way to live. Not to set a perfect example, and not to impart his wise teaching. God is man, 
so that he can die for mankind. He has a life so that he can lay it down in exchange for yours and mine. We look upon the one who was pierced, bruised, beaten, crucified, and buried. Behold the man, the God of your salvation. Amen. confess the faith that we hold in common. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church, that our Lord God would defend her against all the assaults and temptations of the adversary, and keep her perpetually on the true foundation, on Jesus Christ. Almighty and everlasting God, since you have revealed your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ and in the word of his truth, keep, we ask you, in safety the works of your mercy, so that your church spread throughout all nations may be defended against the adversary and may serve you in true faith and persevere in the confession of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, our Lord God Almighty, that he would deliver the world from disease, ward off famine, and free those in bondage, grant health to the sick, and a safe journey to all who travel. Almighty and everlasting God, the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of those who labor, 
May the prayers of those who in any tribulation or distress cry to you graciously come before you, so that in all their necessities they may rejoice in your manifold help and comfort. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who are outside the church, that our Lord God would be pleased to deliver them from their error, call them to faith in the true and living God and his only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and gather them into his family, the church. Almighty and everlasting God, because you seek not the death but the life of all, hear our prayers for all who have no right knowledge of you. Free them from their error and from their sin. And for the glory of your name, bring them into the fellowship of your holy church through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the fruits of the earth, that God would send down his blessing upon them and graciously dispose our hearts to enjoy them according to his own good will. O Lord, Father Almighty, by your word you created and you still continue to bless and uphold all things. We pray you to so reveal to us your word, our Lord Jesus Christ, that he may dwell in our hearts and we may by your grace be made ready to receive your blessing on all the fruits of the earth and these things that pertain to our bodily need. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Finally, let us pray for all these things for which our Lord would have us ask, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generations. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. 